Thank you so much, Dr. Griffin. I remember when Dr. Griffin came into my office earlier this year, and he gave me this pitch for this idea to bring in Mr. David McCullough. And as he was sharing with me his idea, I noticed my jaw was, was down to my belly button, and I realized what a great opportunity this would be for the Utah Valley University Student Association to partner with the Center for Constitutional Studies. So I thank the Center for Constitutional Studies for making this happen and for being the backbone of this event. We as the Utah Valley University Student Association are also pleased to have been able to partner and work with the Center for Constitutional Studies in order to make this event a possibility. We feel this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for our fellow students and hope many of you are in attendance today. Now it is time for me to introduce to you Mr. David McCullough. Mr. McCullough has been a widely acclaimed master of the art of narrative history, a matchless writer. He is twice winner of the Pulitzer Prize, twice winner of the National Book Award, and has received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. Mr. McCullough is twice winner of the pre prestigious Francis Parkman Prize, and for his work overall, he has received the National Book Foundation Distinguished Contribution to American Letters Award and the National Humanities Medal. He has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and has received 47 honorary degrees. Mr. McCullough's book, books include The Johnstown Flood, the Great Bridge, The Path Between the Seas, Mornings on Horseback, Brave Companions, and Truman. His work has been published in 10 languages and, in all, more than 9,500,000 copies are in print. As may be said of few writers, none of his books has ever been out of print. Mr. McCullough's most recent book, The Greater Journey, Americans in Paris, the number one New York Times bestseller, has been called Dazzling, an epic of ideas, history to be savored. His previous work, 1776, has been acclaimed a classic, while John Adams, published in 2001, remains one of the most praised and widely read American biographies of all time. More than three million copies are in print, and it is presently in its 82nd printing. Now, it is my opportunity to introduce to you Mr. David McCullough. Thank you very much. I am uh, pleased, I'm honored, and I feel privileged to take part in this inauguration of the new Constitution Center at the University, Univer Utah Un Valley University and your university, and I congratulate and express my gratitude as an American citizen to all of you who are here tonight who have made this possible. And I particularly wish to thank, with heartfelt admiration, Professor Griffin and President Holland. And I thank Mr. Workman for his fine introduction. And I hope very much that what I have to say tonight will give you some sense of why I feel that this subject this crucial subject to which the new uh, center is dedicated is of not just lasting import, but of particular import now. And also to emphasize that it didn't become what it was because the founding fathers were gods, as they are often portrayed. They weren't gods. Gods can do whatever they want, 
They can accomplish whatever they want. But these were human beings, living, real, flesh and blood human beings. And the fact that they did what they did, despite their own personal failings, despite adversity, despite little or no seeming chance of success, is one of the greatest stories in all of history. And it is true. Now, how anyone can profess to love their country and yet take no interest in the history of our country is almost, for me, beyond imagining. And how anyone could receive, as we all do daily and in all aspects of our lives, the benefits of what those who went before us made possible without any sense of gratitude or sense that maybe we ought to know who they were is also a mystery. You obviously don't feel that way or you wouldn't be here tonight. I wanna begin with a quotation from Harry Truman he once said that the only new thing in, the, in history, the only new thing in the world is the history you don't know. His point being that history repeats itself and that we can see it all around us uh, if we have only uh, the appreciation and the understanding to see it. And I wanna do this by reading to you something written by John Adams to his wife, Abigail, back in Massachusetts as he attended the first Continental Congress in Philadelphia in uh, 1774. He said, but after a month of such acuteness and minuteness of every issue at hand, irrespective of importance, he was wearied to death. The business of Congress had become tedious, he said. This assembly is like no other that ever existed. Every man in it is a great man an orator, a critic, a statesman, and therefore every man upon every question must show his oratory, his criticism, and his political abilities. The consequence is that the business is drawn and spun out to immeasurable length. I believe it were, if it was moved and seconded that we should come to a resolution that three and two make five, we should be entertained with logic and rhetoric, law, history, politics and mathematics concerning the subject for two whole days, and then we should pass the resolution unanimously in the affirmative. <laughs> Some things don't end with the passage of time. Abigail Adams is, to my mind, one of the looming of our American heroes. Uh, one of the most admirable human beings in our history, about whom, as is true of so many of the people that I'm talking about this evening, about whom we can never know enough. She wrote to her husband as he was about to leave for Philadelphia for the first time, you cannot be, I know, nor do I wish to see you an inactive spectator. We have too many high sounding words and too few actions to correspond with them. That could be emphasized by every figure in public life or the spouses of those figures in public life every day in our own time. I sometimes wonder if we're raising a nation of spectators who spend seven hours a day watching television, who turn out to constantly on weekends to giant events of public entertainment of all kinds, just to be spectators. We can't do that. We have to take part, which is very obviously one of the larger lessons of history. Now, among the most obvious lessons of history, is that there's no such thing as the foreseeable future. Never was, never will be. 
Those people who did what they did more than 225 years ago, who accomplished what they did, didn't know how it was going to come out. There's no foreseeable future, and nothing was ever inevitable. It's always in flux. It can always go off in any number of different directions, in any number of different ways, for any number of different reasons. And if you don't understand that because you have no knowledge of history, then you're bound to run into serious trouble as an individual or as a nation. Another very safe uh, and obvious observation, if you stop to think about it, is that nothing ever happened in the past. It happened in the future. Of the, excuse me, it happened in the present, but it was their present, not ours. Adams, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, they didn't walk around saying, isn't this fascinating living in the past? Aren't we quaint in our funny clothes? They were living in a present which was infinitely more uncertain, even infinitely more dangerous and difficult, where life was shorter and harder than we have any idea. Life in 18th century America, even in peacetime, was harder, more precarious, more subject to, to disease and to uh, unex the unexpected vag vagaries of, of nature than we have any idea. We are softies compared to those people. We have been coddled and we have been comforted and we've made, been made to feel secure in ways they never knew. And I think it's fair to say that another very obvious lesson of history is that it isn't just about politics and the military. It's about life. It's about everything. It's about medicine and science and art and music and architecture and money and love. It's about human beings. History is human. So in that spirit, I want to begin with two iconic works of American art. The first is a building in Philadelphia just down the street from Independence Hall known as Carpenter's Hall. It's often missed by many tourists who come to the city to take part in the history to be seen. Carpenter's Hall is not large. It's surprisingly small. It's an exquisite, small uh, brick building with a cupola in perfect balance, and it belonged to the Carpenters' Union in 1774 and 5 as it still does. And when you walk into that building and you realize that that was where the first Continental Congress met, in a space about the size of where this orchestra sits, less, that that's where it all began. It's inspiring, it's humbling, and a reminder that great things can spring from very small origins. If we want the oak acorns, there they are. Upstairs in Carpenter's Hall is a library, the first lending library in America, started by Benjamin Franklin. So there you have an expression of a free society governing itself, attempting to, but always with the idea that with it goes learning. The library, books, the world, the excitement of ideas. We are a nation that has thrived on ideas. Jefferson said any nation that expects to be ignorant and free 
expects what never was and never will be, and let us never, ever forget it. Let us never, ever forget it when we're talking and thinking about the role of our teachers in our country. There is nobody doing more important work, more work that will last longer and have greater influence than our teachers. And I like to think of those founders as teachers. They're teaching us. They are there. Their story, their accomplishments, their example is there to teach us, not just as students in school, but all through life, to take heart from them, to take inspiration from them, and to take their ideas to maybe encourage new ideas on our own parts. Now, the second iconic work of art, beside the architecture of Carpenter's Hall, is the most famous painting ever done by an American, famous in that it's been seen by more, um, more human beings, more Americans than any painting ever done. And it is uh, the great scene of the signing of the Declaration by John Trumbull. And one of the reasons it's seen by so many people is that it hangs in, in, in a prominent, prominent position in the in the, uh, in the Capitol, in the grand, uh, below the rotunda, in the rotunda, below the, the dome of the Capitol, where thousands of people go through every day, seven days a week, year after year, for well, well over 100 years it's been there. Now, no, almost nothing in that painting is accurate. First of all, the Declaration of Independence wasn't signed on July 4th. If you had to pick a date for the origin of the Declaration of Independence, it's July 2nd. Nothing really happened in Philadelphia in 1776 on July 4th. That's the date on the document. So it didn't happen that day, nor did it all happen at once with everybody present to sign. The signing didn't begin until August, and then it stretched on when different members showed up back in Philadelphia at different times on through the rest of the year and into the year after. The drapes are wrong. The chairs are wrong. There's a military banner hanging in the background on the main wall, very decorative, never existed, never was there. It's a creation of the artist. And the painting itself is an enlarged version and nowhere near as powerful a work of art as the original, which hangs in the Yale Art Gallery in New Haven, Connecticut, which is only about one foot by three feet, about that big, small. And it's small because John Trumbull had lost an eye as a child in an accident, and he only had one eye, and therefore his depth capacity is, is his, his vision did not have the depth capacity that comes with two eyes. And so the smaller he worked, the easier it was for him to handle things. It's almost as if he's working with a jeweler's eye. And so all the faces, everything are very small. Now, everything is inaccurate in the painting, except for one very important thing. The faces, the individual faces, 48 of them, all accurate. More than 30 of them painted from life. He traveled up and down the country to find these people to do studies or to do the actual painting sketches of the real human being. Why is that so important? Because they were recognizable because they were each identifiable, signing their names to this document, which was signing a death notice. You were committing treason against the Crown. They were identifiable, and they were therefore accountable. And we should take heart from that. We are accountable. We are accountable for what happens in the government and the and the direction of our country and our government, and we are accountable for the education of our children and grandchildren. That accountability 
is stated right there for us to remember. And let us hope with all our hearts that we do remember. Now, when that document was signed, we were at war. Most people don't realize that. They think they signed the document and then the war began. We were at war. The British had just landed 32,000 troops of the finest army in the world in New York. A greater army than the size of all of Philadelphia at that time, which was then the largest city in our country. Bravery, courage, courage, character. Think of the courage it took. It's not just their words that we should remember, it's what was in their hearts and their devotion to the ideal. Nor did they have the gratifying realization that the whole country was behind them. If they'd taken a poll in those days, if they lived by polls in those days, there would have been no Declaration of Independence. There would have been no Revolutionary War. At least one third of the country were absolutely against it. Another third were for it. And the remaining third, in the good old human way, were standing by to see which way it came out, and then they joined them. So they were against the tide. They were up against the greatest army in the world. They had no money. And let us not forget that if it weren't for France, we couldn't possibly have fought the war, not just because of the French army that came over and because of people like Lafayette or the French Navy, but because of French financing and Dutch financing. So we therefore already, immediately, of necessity, had to be dealing with the rest of the world. This wasn't an isolated example, and before it was over, our revolution, as most Americans unfortunately don't realize, became a world war. The most important war in our history, by far, because it's what gave us birth as a people and as, a, as an idea and an ideal. Nor should we think that the Constitution was something that was just kind of out, came out of the blue in, uh, in Philadelphia 225 years ago. It was all nurturing, cooking, brewing, if you will, uh, for a very long time. And not just here, it's, it's in the language, it's in the poetry and the polit political philosophy that we inherited from principally the mother country of England. Act well your part, there all the honor lies. All of them quoted that line, loved that line, lived that line. It was their creed, ideally. Act well your part, there all the honor lies. It's from Alexander Pope's essay on man. What is it telling us? Act well your part, play your part, do, you, do what you have to do, because you are involved, they felt at that moment, here, you were involved in one of the greatest human dramas in all of history. And fate or God or the throw of the dice or the stars and formation, whatever one chose to see it as the determining influence, has cast you in a critical role. So you must act to the best of your ability, just as it says in the oath of office for the presidency. Why? For money? No. Fame? No. Power? No. Honor. We pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. We don't talk much about honor anymore. And we forget very quickly those in positions of public responsibility who behave dishonorably. To be dishonorable to have no sense of honor in that day and age disqualified you, not just from taking part in the eyes of those working with you, but in your own 
self-esteem, your own valuation of yourself. These are ultimately important to understand because we too should be taking heart, taking our, our belief in our way of life from those sources. It's why it's so very important that history be seen also through the literature of history. What was the power of the best scenes in Shakespeare, the influence on people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson? What did Cicero really convey to Adams? To Adams, Cicero was his hero as much as anybody alive. And it was Cicero who said, among other things, to go through life without, with no sense of history is to go through life with the outlook of a child. All of them read history. All of them knew history. And interestingly, it wasn't the history of the British Empire or of Europe. It was the classical history, the history of Greece and Rome. And thank goodness for that because that, the model of what we are and became goes back that far. Now, well before the war ended, well before the Constitutional Convention gathered in Philadelphia after the war, John Adams wrote the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And just to show that there are precedents for all of these marvelous developments. I want to just read a little bit to you from that Constitution, which is still the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. First of all, he set up a three-part government with a legislature, an executive, and an independent judiciary. And his emphasis on the independent judiciary was one of the most important contributions he made to our country, ever. But he also added a third ingredient, which unfortunately did not get into the Constitution of our country, though eventually we would come to understand that this was as essential as some of these other freedoms. And that was included in one memorable paragraph that I would like very much for you to listen closely to. Wisdom and knowledge, as well as virtue, diffused generally among the body of the people is necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties. And as these depend on spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people, in other words, everybody, it shall be the duty, not shall be something that the legislatures and executives will do. It shall be the duty of legislators and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth. And this is the choice of word I dearly love, to cherish, cherish the interests of literature and the sciences and all the seminaries of them, especially the University of Cambridge, public schools and grammar schools in all towns. To encourage private societies and public institutions, rewards and immunities for the promotion. Now, what does education mean? Listen to what, what he sees it. This is no limited uh, view of education with blinders on. This is everything. For the promotion of agriculture, arts, sciences, commerce, trades, manufactures, and a natural history of the country. To countenance and inculcate the principles of humanity and general benevolence. Benevolence, public and private charity, industry, frugality, frugality, honesty. We will teach honesty and punctuality in their dealings. Sincerity, good humor, there will be good humor, and all social affections and generous sentiments among the people. Adams was quite sure that the 225 delegates who were gathered in the first church in Cambridge to uh, 
create a, a constitution for Massachusetts, he was sure they would vote that down. Not only did they vote for it, they voted for it unanimously. But that has become, in the real life of our country, what we all believe in. We look at the great civilization of the Middle Ages in Europe, especially the great cathedrals in France, and, 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 and we, we're, taken, we're taken into a new realm of what humanity can accomplish. These magnificent creations and we wonder in our hearts, what are we building? What are our cathedrals, our great cathedrals? What is gonna come out of this civilization in the long run? What will people be remembering us for? I think we are building great cathedrals. But the strange thing is we don't seem to realize it. We don't see them. We don't understand what an amazing thing we have done and are doing. And that is that we have created in this country the greatest universities in the world. Yes, they have problems. Yes, our system of education needs much improvement, much revision, much more attention. But there is no question that the reason all these gifted people from all over the world are coming to our country to go to college and to go to the universities is because they are the greatest universities in the world. And we have spent generously for it. We don't think of that. We think we're, we're spending it for our beloved sons, daughters, grandchildren, but we are in the process, we have all in, been united in this theme of education, which began because of the genius of the founders. It began with people like Benjamin Rush, the physician and one of the youngest signers of the Declaration of Independence, who initiated the elective system to college education, who was the first to stress that we must teach modern European languages, not just Latin and Greek. This is part of us, and we should recognize it, and we should be proud as can be of it, and we should not let our focus stray from that. Why? The pursuit of happiness. That's what they meant. They didn't mean longer vacations. The word vacation was unknown. The idea of a vacation was unknown. They didn't mean more stuff. They meant the life of the mind, the love of learning. That's the happiness, accomplishment, worthy accomplishment, valuable accomplishment. Now, they were flawed often John Adams was a cranky, often peevish, uh, sometimes uh, uh, self-pitying, sometimes rude man, honest to a fault. But he was also one of the most brilliant minds of that era, that age of brilliant minds. A young man who, as he said, went to college and discovered books and read forever. When he was in his 80s, he was launching into a 16-volume history of France in French, which he had taught himself. George Washington was an avid architect, interior decorator, landscape architect, gardener, farmer, a man of many interests and talents. Go to Mount Vernon, take a look at it. Every single aspect of that magnificent house and its setting he designed. 
He chose the color of the paint, the, the draperies at the windows. He chose the bedspreads. He was avidly interested in, in what a beautiful surrounding will do to the spirit. Jefferson, of course, was one of the greatest American architects ever, as will, we hope, stand forever uh, as an emblem at Charlottesville, not just at Monticello, but at the University of Virginia, which he prided as his, one of his greatest accomplishments. On his gravestone, as many of you know, he didn't even list, didn't even want it listed that he was president of the United States, but as one of the founders of the University of Virginia and Virginia's law, which provides freedom of religion. Which is why when Monticello was in ruins, it was a Jewish admiral from Philadelphia who saved it because neither the government of Virginia nor the government of Washington wanted to do anything to save it. And later when the levy, as they pronounced the name, spelled as, as Levy, <laughs> when the Levy family could no longer afford to, to maintain the house, a Jewish group in New York founded the Jefferson Memorial Foundation because they did, would not stand by and let the house go to ruins. Not the, how, the house, it wasn't only the home, but was the design and the creation of one of the greatest leaders in our history and the one who is, who demanded freedom of religion. And that foundation still maintains the house today, and it's why we can all go there and visit and learn from it. We should take our children and take our grandchildren to these places. Take them to the, to the what was the old state house, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, <laughs> where both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were signed. And not just signed, debated and agonized and argued and, and thought about over and over through intensely hot summers before the, in the early part of the war and then after the war. In, in secrecy, they had to keep all the windows closed because their, their, their deliberations had to be secret in order they could all in, speak their minds honestly, candidly. Imagine being cooped up in Philadelphia in the summertime with no air conditioning, with the uh, flies and mosquitoes active in the extreme, knowing that nothing you said could possibly be allowed to get out. I've had um, the great privilege of getting to know many of these people very well because I've spent days, months, years with them, a major part of my life with them, reading what they wrote, reading what was said about them, reading their public pronouncements and their private correspondence. In many ways, I've come to know them better than I know people in my own real life. For one thing, in your own real life, you don't get to read other people's mail the way you do <laughs> as an historian. And often they're working their thoughts out on paper. The fact that they wrote what they said, wrote uh, and what they believe, wrote it and worked it out themselves is a key, not just to them, but the age in which they lived. They didn't have other people writing what they were going to say for them, or scanning it through its possible media uh, effectiveness and so forth. And in their private correspondence, they're struggling to find out what they think. Working your thoughts out on paper, it used to be called. It's why we must emphasize writing in our system of education, and particularly in our universities and colleges. Students should be required to write far more than they have to write in order to find out the excitement of suddenly discovering an idea, a thought, 
because you're writing that you never would have had if you hadn't been writing, hadn't been forced to think about it and write about it. It's been said, I don't know what I think until I write. I understand that perfectly. I'm often asked at the beginning of a project, a new book, well, what's your theme? And I make something up just to pacify them. I have no idea what my theme is more often than not. That's one of the reasons I'm writing the book, to find out. I write to find out. And that's the adventure of learning. That's the excitement of learning. You're on, a you're on the hunt, you're on a detective case. You're making discoveries, it's an adventure. And these men and women all understood that. I hope very much that universities and colleges all over the country will soon know about the new Constitution Center here at Utah Valley University. And I hope they'll realize the degree to which this has come about because of Professor Riff, Rick Griffin and President Holland. It didn't just happen any more than the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or the success of the Revolutionary War just happened. It happened because of leadership, leadership here at this university and the community of ideas and shared objectives that a great university can become. I took a walk through the campus today, saw all the cranes and the bulldozers and all the building going on. I thought, how exciting. Here at the beginning, here in the, at the time of creation, present at the creation, as it were. And isn't that the way it should be? Building anew with noble, noble intent and how it, what an example it sets for the community, for the state, and for our country. So on you go, all of you, and may all that you hope will be achieved here come to pass, and may none of us ever forget how blessed, how lucky, how, it, how fortunate in the extreme we are to live in this very great country and to have the example of so many who have been there at the very creation, at the time of our founding. That's my talk.